A water hole in Africa is like Piccadilly Circus in London or Times Square in New York. Sooner or later, everyone from miles around shows up. Some come to eat. Most come to drink. A few come to hunt. This is the story of the visitors, the residents, and the dramas that affect their lives at a typical waterhole in Etosha National Park, Namibia. It's just after the rains. This waterhole in Etosha is different from those in many parts of Africa. It's spring-fed, and unlike most other waterholes, never dries up. You'd expect that animals would come thronging to it once the rains have topped it up. But not a bit of it. It's deserted, except for the resident birds, like the damp chick and red bull teal. After a few weeks of hot sun, the rainwater puddles out in the bush all dry up. Then the animals start to trickle back. A few at first, and then in gradually increasing herds. The year-round story of this Etosha waterhole starts just after the rain. The return of the herds is bad news for two of the resident birds. A pair of blacksmith plovers has decided to nest right at the water's edge. Plovers are courageous birds. They stand their ground against all comers, spreading their wings and cursing in defense of their nest. The surviving yellow flowers will eventually all get eaten. The big animals aren't particularly fond of them. But a weed that flourishes where all the grass has been eaten around the waterhole. The springbok try to avoid them, not always successfully. Now, the plovers have eggs to protect from all those trampling hooves. large warthogs arrive to drink and wallow and add to the plover's problems. At the water hole, there's always some new happening. The rains have triggered off the hatching of millions of small brown flies, providing a feast for water birds especially the waders. 
separately and delicately. The fulvous tree duck and the cape teal just scoop them up wholesale with their bills. The plague of flies has come at just the right time for the red-billed teal and their hungry brood of duckies. There always seems to be one in every breed who ignores the convoy system without appreciating the danger of plants. The threat this time comes from a llama pheasant. Missed both times. The little teal survives by diving and rejoins the group. The llama's next attack is on the whole convoy. are still having serious problems. There's only one possible treatment for nosy zebra. broke all three eggs, but didn't eat one of them. It was probably hoping to find the full form of chicken side. The plovers, spirited diving attacks are all in vain. Plover will probably lay again in a safer place. The parents recover the cracked eggs and carry them about 30 yards away. They pull the embryos out of the shells and then give the whole situation up as hopeless. have their young in the time of good grazing after the first rains. The young are just the sort of easy meat a lion is always looking for.
usually leave severely alone. Just the same, elephants would be much happier if the lions weren't around when they bring their young to drink. And they tell them so in no uncertain manner. Just after the rains, the elephants of Etosha do the biggest disappearing trick of all. They simply vanish into the woodland to the northeast. They do so largely to avoid the soft soil in which the waterhole lies, where they could easily get bogged down. A month after the rains have stopped, the country dries up fast, and suddenly they're back in great strength. There's nothing an elephant loves so much as water. soil is the elephant equivalent of talcum powder. Because of the colour of the soil, pink elephants are quite common in Natasha.
Watch how the tongue manipulates the thorns to strip the flowers. When a giraffe takes a drink, it looks as though it must suffer a sudden rush of blood to the head. So it would do, but for a network of spongy tissues or valves between neck and brain that absorb the blood and slow up the downward flow. In a tusha, the combined attractions of acacias and a drink sometimes draw herds of 30 or 40 giraffes to the water hole. But such a gathering rarely results in outbreaks of high spirits like this. Much of the herd of horses, it all seems to be trimmed off by one skittish animal. muscular legs, so lazily graceful in play, can kill a lion with a single kick. Even though giraffes at a water hole look easy play, lions usually leave the adults alone. This giraffe is an exception and has a bad shoulder wound from a previous lion attack. Perhaps the wound is why this lion made another half-hearted attempt. Somehow, both parties seem to recognize that it's not going to come to anything. The lions lie down and the giraffe, slowly and without any sign of alarm, approaches the water once more. Dusk is not very far away. The giraffe wisely decides that the half light might be a bad time to push its luck any further. Sunset is the time when the prey animals leave the water hole and seek the comparative safety of the open plains.
is one of the black rhinos, very last strongholds. Though you wouldn't guess this if you relied simply on daylight for your observations. At night, they come to drink and indulge in the heavyweight punch-ups so dear to a rhino's armor-protected heart. The elephant herd just ignores the rhino goings on and takes pride of place in the water. Some double banded sand grouse have taken advantage of the full moon to do some night flying and drinking. with a large calf as a dispute with another calf. <laughs> when a smaller herd of elephants arrives, it finds itself in the middle of a crowd of lions, and they just can't be ignored. Stalking technique, all on its own.
smaller species that it's very successful with. This time it's taking no chances and flies off with its prey, pursued by the eagle. The doves who come to drink at the water hole face submarine attack as well. This one has a lucky escape. But the capture of the next victim has an almost prehistoric horror about it. Though bedraggled, the dove finally escapes. The terrapins, finding themselves too far from the water to feel safe, scutter back to fly again. Like most cats, Lions are naturally curious. They're also nervous of unfamiliar situations. A very unfamiliar situation is about to develop. If you hadn't seen the terrapins trap the doves by the leg, you wouldn't have a clue what has happened to this egret. Note the black-headed heron hoping to gain from the egret's plight. An approaching lioness is too much even for the heron. At least one terrapin has got a firm grip on the egret's foot. The lions appear never to have seen anything like this in their entire lives. By the time a cub goes to investigate, the egret is free. <coughs> free, but decidedly lame. Very few predators can get the better of a terrapin, but just occasionally it does happen. The fish eagle's curved talons and hooked beak can find the chinks in the terrapin's armor. Perhaps this was why the terrapins who attacked the dove were so anxious not to stray too far from the water. The armor of the tortoise just has
has to be foolproof. Though it can swim, it lives practically all its life on land. Then it's exposed to all manner of dangers, from lions who would like to eat it, to elephants who might accidentally step on it. The water hole provides moments of comedy. Its scenario also includes scenes of extreme beauty. The big friends are coming to drink among a small party of kudu.
August is the height of the dry season. The rains won't start until October. Now the animals are completely dependent on Natasha's waterholes for their survival. The mercy is that these are spring fed and almost never dry up. Banded mongooses comes to drink. The parents are cautious. They've got a lot of young with them. Those are the marker sandflies. Despite his size, the wallowing warthog doesn't worry the mongooses. But the jackal makes everyone slightly apprehensive. waiting to get to the water for some time. They've been scared of crossing a large open space. The covers have gradually built up until there are hundreds of birds waiting to cross. Finally, when numbers give them courage, it's as if a dam has broken, releasing a flood of birds. Some get their drink. But then the jackal spooks them, just as it spooked the mongooses. A far stealthier and deadlier hunter lurks beneath the surface of the waterhole. The python snorkels its nostrils cunningly hidden among the waterweed. The Egyptian goose spots the danger. For the red bull teal, it's already too late. Caught in the python's coils, the duck is quickly squeezed to death. While the rest of its ten-foot body puts on the lethal pressure, the python comes up for air. A snake like this can stay totally submerged for at least an hour. The final act of the drama. The python swallows the duck, still gripped in its coils.
whales aren't usually found feeding on water holes. They're too small. But when the 70 mile long Itosha Pan dries up, then they have nowhere else to go without making a long journey. <laughs> soda lakes or of the coast. So flamingos are rarely seen in company with drinking zebra, kudu and wildebeest. Even rarer is to find them in such a cramped and unlikely setting, forming up into display parties. This strutting march is a premium to courtship. They've got to go through the routine somewhere, and the water hole is the only permanent water around. They're mostly lesser flamingos, but with some craters among them. Sets, sweep their bills in the foreground, probably looking for the same sort of crustacea that the flamingos are having to feed on under drought conditions. One reason why flamingos choose large, remote lakes on which to feed and breed is that they feel safe there from land predators. There's no guarantee of such safety here. When the rains come, the Atasha Pan will flood and the flamingos will return there. If the rains are late, they may have to move hundreds of miles perhaps to the salt pans along the coast. The height of the dry season is an easy time for hunters. Antelope, like these kudu, have to concentrate at the water hole. Adult kudu are usually safe from cheetah. They're too big. She's after small again. Springbok. This time she loses her quarry and the dust kicked up in the chase. She's got a large family to feed, so she'll stick around the water hole until she does kill. disregards the adult springbok to her left and picks a younger victim. to the cubs left close to the water hole.
lets her family feed before she eats herself. she'll lead them down for a drink. For the cheetah family too, the water hole has provided all the necessities of life. But very soon now, the water hole will cease to mean anything in the lives of all these animals. It's October and the rains are coming. The springboks see the storms and start to move away from the permanent water. There's both food and drink out there. The rain is coming. To the water tunnel, they move around a bit, but the permanent residents, the teal, the Egyptian geese, will stay on throughout the rains that will continue to deluge down from October to March. And at the end of the downpour, the grass will be green again. The water hole will still be there. It'll be a little fuller and a lot fresher, but there won't be an animal in sight. There'll be carpets of yellow flowers, but nothing to eat them. It's hard to imagine that all those dramas ever took place here. But give it a few weeks and let the sun do its work, and they'll all be back. For all the water hose dangers, the animals of Atosha would perish if they stayed away from it too long. <laughs> survival has arrived on video. From the wildlife of Africa to life forms the human eye cannot see. From the largest volcano on Earth to the creatures that live beneath it, the survival camera has seen it all. Now collect these masterpieces of filmmaking in a new series of video cassettes. Take a closer look now at some of the titles currently available. Prepare yourself for a very special flight. Let us take you on the safari by balloon and a breathtaking journey across Africa. In 1883, 
a volcanic island erupted with a band heard for over 3,000 miles. This was Krakatoa and the day that shook the world. over a hundred feet high wiped out entire villages, killing over 36,000 people. Today, nature has repaired the damage, and a new volcano has formed, colonized by thousands of animals, plants, and reptiles. long enough, and you'll meet all the local inhabitants who come here for their daily refreshment. Some tall, some large, some small. Some are harmless, others dangerous. is the legend of the lightning bird, although in reality is a hammer-headed stork. However, this small brown bird is known in Africa as the king of all birds. It builds a number of huge, strong nests. It only lays its eggs in one, leaving the other unoccupied nests for other inhabitants. <laughs> Here is Africa's aerial acrobat, the Battler Eagle, Tunnel. of the family, a dwarf mongoose will stand up to any enemy, no matter how deadly. Dwarf mongooses have the most highly organized society known among the small mammals. In their band is a single extended family, known by a female, scientists have done the alpha female. She and the senior male, known as the alpha male, are the parents of all the family's young. There is a job for every member of the band, though one animal does not necessarily perform just one task. Babysitters must stay with the young while the band is out foraging. Lookouts must keep watch for predators. Soldiers must confront attackers. Termite mines provide safe retreats against their enemies. It's a tall eagle. An eagle flying about in a tree makes the lookouts uneasy. Its unusual behavior demands his attention, but he must still keep watch all round. Chanting goshawks met for life. They are the main enemy of the mongooses. On a man, the dwarfs are safe, so long as they see the hawk in time. The averages 12 to 14 members and controls a territory of about one square kilometer of bushland. 
containing about 60 termite mounds and other safe hiding places. The mongooses cannot always see one another in the high grass, so they keep in touch vocally with a complex language of 18 distinct calls. Different frequencies of the contact call identify each individual. If one goes astray, volume is increased to guide him back. The lookout must watch most carefully in the opposite direction to that taken by the band. He can't join them until another advanced lookout is taken over, this time with a youngster who is learning the job. Now he has joined the band quickly. Alone, with his rear unguarded, this is the most dangerous time for a dwarf mongoose. occur among animals that are less than 12 months old. Those that survive the attacks of goshawks and other predators during their first year will probably live for 10 to 15 years. That's a long time for such a small animal. so their water supply. Insect fat, in particular, has a very high liquid content. Hornbills and mongooses are often found together, and the relationship has benefits for both parties. The hornbill helps to warn of danger, and finds the mongoose a useful source of food. are immune to the scorpion sting, but they have to learn how to tackle the creatures. An adult would have quickly nipped off the troublesome claws. This youngster is lucky he has not already lost his meal to another mongoose, or to a hornbill. and their hornbills too.
saw what we do to start with. The home girl's wife will be sealed up for five weeks, incubating her eggs. A lot more than a spider's leg will be needed to satisfy her. attention fixed on the black tipped and his partner, the lizards are caught unawares by the second goshawk. There's a lizard in the bush. He's got it. Now the second one. This is too much. Risking all, the dwarf mongooses attack. The female is near her time and must find a place in which to have her young. Tawny plated lizards, who also live in the termite mines, are not a threat. In fact, they have to put up with quite a lot from the young mongooses. Both mongoose and tawny plated think otherwise of the monitor lizard. is very close, the lookout must still check the sky. The alpha female is worried about the monitor lizard. This man does no good. She's off. The 
there's no way the band could defend her young against such a large lizard. The mound is left to the lizards, small and large. Even as the larger eyes the smaller, developments overhead interrupt the play. The immature martial eagle from his position in the sky can see both the monitor and the mongooses in the mounds. The alpha female moves on again, still looking for a safe mount. this one either. She hurries on to the next. A neighboring band has taken over the next band, which stands at the very edge of her territory. Retreating into her territory, the alpha female leads her band in an excited marking session. The servant says the mind belongs to her band and will last for about 30 days, the same time it normally takes a band to work its way around its territory. The animals leave their marks in order of rank, each contributing to the distinctive communal scent of the band. spitting cobra is a terrifying adversary for the dwarf mongoose, and it's never very far away. The goosehawk is up to something, and now that he's on the ground, the mongooses can't see it. on the ground presents little danger to the mongooses, but should it get airborne, it will become deadly. The mongooses know this, so does the Franklin, and it's the Franklin that the goshawk is after. He's got it, but a mongoose chases him off. The Franklin is still alive and hiding. The mongoose is only interested in the scent of the goshawk. Franklin moves away, cautiously, unseen by the goshawk, who now seems reluctant to go for the mongoose that just attacked him. does manage to catch a snake. chosen a small man, well protected from aerial attack. Her babies probably were born in the early hours of the morning. The man has just a few small 
small holes, easily guarded by teams of babysitters and lookouts. While the males stand guard above, a female looks after the babies below. There are four of them, each 10 centimeters long, born hairless with eyes which will not open for 11 days. There is no nest, because tomorrow the band will more than likely move on again, carrying the babies with them. There is a special call which summons all the band to drive off a snake. The Fafata strike is the fastest of all African snakes. Its venom is deadly poisonous to most animals. Remarkably, the mongoose's reactions are even faster than the snakes. The babysitters can hear the summons just what it means. All the same, it's a difficult decision to go and help the band or to move the babies. It's the subordinate males that lead the attack. safety, the rest of the band engaged the snake, and the alpha pair start throat scratching and cheek marking, expressing their high excitement before joining the fray. extremely high tolerance of snake venom, but there is still the very real danger of being eaten. The snake has had enough. It only wants to get away. The mongooses have achieved their purpose and are content to let it go. With a few farewell nips. for the survival of their young brothers and sisters. The babysitters and lookouts can never relax. One mistake, one wrong judgment from any member of the band could cost the babies their lives.
inside the mound, the babies are safe. But there will be many more attacks before they are able to fend for themselves. The most hazardous time of their lives is still to come. The Carmel Bee Eater stays with the secretary bird for the insects that the larger bird disturbs. Both mongooses stay together for reasons of security. The Marshal is Africa's largest eagle, a formidable predator. But this time, it's a banded mongoose which has been snatched from its group. consumes, if he can hang on to it long enough. Mice are about the largest prey that a dwarf mongoose can tackle, and they are killed with one bite. But even a mouse is not shared. Very occasionally, the lookout just doesn't see the goshawk coming. Occasionally, the lookout just doesn't see the goshawk coming. But they're lucky. The goshawk is more interested in the mice. Once the goshawk is on the ground, the mongoose has the advantage. Here's the second goshawk. Got it. But a mouse, not a mongoose. In the end, they've both got one. The babysitting teams are alone for many hours every day, and anything can happen during that time. The alpha female leads the rest of the band off on their daily round of activity. Foraging, marking, visiting mounds, which often takes them up to a kilometer away from the babysitters. It's the grey spitting cobra. And the lookout hasn't seen it yet. Now he has. Hearing the summons, the band rushes back to the babysitters. Snakes are the only predators that can reach the babies inside the mound. They must move the babies now. Adult males keep track of the snake while it searches the mound.
In the confusion, a babysitter loses contact with the band. If the snake sees the mongoose, that's the end of the baby. And the babysitter would probably die too, trying to defend it. by. For the moment, she's left the baby in the log. The alpha female has one of the babies. The other two, and the snake, are nowhere to be seen. The alpha female still has one of the babies. Babysitters join her with two of the others. Still no sign of the snake. is following the mongols by scent. He's not going to give up. Abruptly, the alpha male and some soldiers turn back. It seems suicidal. These mongooses cannot hope to kill the cobra. Indeed, it's much more likely to kill them, but they know what they're doing. Delay is the objective. The babies must get away. Lightning movements confuse the snake and prevent it lining up for a strike on a single individual. Standing together like this against such a deadly foe, the soldiers are risking their individual lives, but ensuring the continued survival of their band, and indeed, the species. is to regroup. Some mongooses go out and position themselves where they can be easily seen, acting as visual markers for those still lost. Each mongoose is greeted as it rejoins the band, but none relax completely until every member is accounted for. After such a harrowing experience, the lookouts remain alert until last light.
Every morning, before leaving the mound, the men uses the new their scent on the marking post. From the moment the builders can move about on their own, they show keen interest in the marking ceremonies. Cheek marking, like this, is stimulated by excitement. The bands are still not recovered from yesterday's encounter with the cobra. As always, no one travels any distance from the mine before the alpha female gives the signal. Then, all must follow her. This team of babysitters will be on duty until the band returns around midday. Then another team will take over for the afternoon shift. They're going to be quite busy until then. Baby mongooses go through all the motions of marking, even though their scent glands are not functioning yet. Although, like all babies, they spend a great deal of time playing, by this age, baby mongooses can already perform almost all the other distinctive behavior patterns of the adult as well. this time, but the lesson is important. is sleep in the cooling vents of the mound, which are quite separate from the passages most frequently used by the termites. Mongoose society requires all its members to devote themselves to the band, which in turn gives each individual a maximum chance of survival. It may seem tyrannical that only the alpha pair rears young, but this is how the band keeps population growth under control, while at the same time ensuring that there are always enough mongooses to perform all the essential duties. A band must have at least five adult members. If every female was permitted to raise her young, there would not be enough adults to go around. Every member would suffer, and the band would soon be wiped out.
one babysitter below always remains alert, in tier with the lookout above. Babies of another kind are emerging. The eggs were laid some weeks ago, and the stable temperature and humidity of the mound has incubated them perfectly, without any help from the parent snakes. Snakes, 25 centimeters long, come out of eggs just two and a half centimeters across. snakes hatch in abundance, not many live long. The babies have first rights to food caught by any member of the band, and they exercise that right with emotions. Another snake has hatched and surfaced. She's not going to get much of that one either. The babies will be allowed to take food from the adults like this until they're able to hunt for themselves at about three and a half months. Even then, they steal with impunity and will continue to hold the most privileged position in the band until the next litter arrives, by which time they'll be about one year old. are keen to move out on their own, beyond the confines of the mound. The Quilia is a small bird which arrives suddenly in large flocks.
For a time, the queen will provide the mongoose with an unexpected and plentiful food supply. But when the eggs hatch, the situation changes dramatically. Eagles and Malibu storks fly in to feed on the chicks, and the mongooses suddenly find themselves surrounded by hundreds of predators. This baby is asking for trouble. The marabou could swallow a mongoose in one gulp. Two of the band managed to get back to the mound. There's no sign of the others. in the mound may be frightened, but they're safe, so long as they stay below. It's the ones outside that are in danger. Sundown, the storks flung off to roost. Still no sign of the others. It's only after the last marabou has left that the rest of the band return. They must have been pinned down in some hiding place for the whole day, but they all managed to make it back. The alpha female sets off very early next morning, without any of the usual marking ceremonies. Agitated, the babysitters grab the babies and chase after her. The mongooses all left before the storks arrived. The babies are two weeks older now and a lot more difficult to carry. They move about with the group, but are still closely watched by the babysitters. Now they are learning about the wider world, exploring, and even more keen to add their scent to the band's marking posts around the territory. Scent means belonging. Each mongoose makes a distinctive contribution to the band's communal scent, and as the youngsters' glands develop, it is important that they add their scent too.
dwarf mongooses are not feeding themselves or defending themselves, they are most likely to be playing among themselves. For the mongoose, play is much more than just a release of tension. All but the alpha females spend a lot of time playing, and unlike other social mammals, everyone joins in. Even the oldest plays just as actively as the young ones. It is in play that the bonds within the group are created, reinforced and maintained. And everyone wants to play with the babies, the most important members of the band. babies are nearly three months old, almost through the most dangerous period of their lives. All 14 members of the band have played a part in their care and protection, even to the extent of facing death for them. Now they have a good chance of living a full 10 to 15 years, contributing in their turn to the survival of this unique society among animals, which depends so much upon the cooperation of every member of the band. survival has arrived on video. From the wildlife of Africa to life forms the human eye cannot see. From the largest volcano on Earth to the creatures that live beneath it, the survival camera has seen it all. collect these masterpieces of filmmaking in a new series of video cassettes. Take a closer look now at some of the titles currently available. Prepare yourself for a very special flight. Let us take you on the safari by balloon and a breathtaking journey across Africa. <laughs> Some tall, 
some large, some small. Some are harmless, others dangerous. This is the legend of the lightning bird, although in reality he's a hammer-headed stork. However, this small brown bird is known in Africa as the king of all birds. It builds a number of huge, strong nests. It only lays its eggs in one, leaving the other unoccupied nests for other inhabitants. Here is Africa's aerial acrobat, the battler eagle, tumbler in the sky. Flying, diving, gliding, nesting, the unique study of a mysterious bird. The flight of the snow geese focuses on the migration of 300,000 snow geese who head south over 2,500 miles to Texas, which will nest on the tundra to the west of Hudson Bay. This beautiful video tells the whole story. Welcome to Animals of Africa. It might seem surprising, but lions are nocturnal animals. Usually lions are most active at dawn and dusk. It's also the time that fear among the other animals creeps over the vast savanna. Join us now for a special close-up look at the king of the jungle when the lions go to drink. 
Scorching sun of day, we come after the Pisagana watering hole. Zebra, during the grazing foray, seldom wandered more than a few miles from a drinking source. They aren't territorial by nature, and will travel wherever water is plentiful. The playfulness of this lioness indicates that she's in need. Normally, these are ideal hours for hunting, and the zebra is one of the lion's favorite prey. In the water, zebra are deprived of their principal defense of the speed, so this herd reacts cautiously to the sound of lions roaring. But when a lion is seriously stalking, he does so silently. Migratory blue crane stopping to feed and drink during their journey can be recognized even in silhouette by their distinctive large heads and drooping secondary feathers. Zebra frequently travel in small family groups, but large herds such as this come together at common feeding grounds. because of the potential prey, as well as a place to drink and cool off. Only on rare occasion will a predator attack so large an animal as a giraffe. The contact token of the blue crane keeps the flock together. Claiming this territory assures the lion of ample prey, as herbivores depend on the water and the grassy plains for their survival. A herd of wildebeest has joined the zebra on the grazing grounds. This is not uncommon as the two species have a strong mutually protective compatibility. Seldom will a lion attack a large herd of animals, but will try to separate an animal from the herd, especially the young, feeble, or injured ones. The size, strength, and dangerous horns of a healthy and mature wildebeest serve to discourage most predators. Moving with the zebra reduces the danger of being taken by surprise. Neither animal panics at the presence of a lion, as long as it maintains a safe distance. The males of both herds generally position themselves between the lion and their families, and keep a watchful eye on the predator's movements. If the lion approaches too near their flight distance, these signals will signal the rest of the herd to move away. <laughs> attention is caught by the sound of new arrivals approaching the water hall, a small herd of elephants. In such an abundance of prey, the lion isn't desperate. He's content to wait. His opportunity will come. Season is a critical time for the dominant male of a lion tribe, as this is when his territory is most likely to be challenged. The scent of a female in heat will attract unattached young males who travel in bachelor tribes, and fierce battles often ensue. Females too have a hierarchy of dominance within the tribe, and if the lioness doesn't behave properly submissive with a dominant female, a scuffle may occur. Followed by two bachelors, approach the zebra herd. 
A warning alert is sounded, and when the lioness breaches the flight distance, the sentinels signal the rest of the herd to flee. The second lioness joins the hunt, but the zebra are now aware of their presence, creating a standoff. charge is futile. The lioness wasn't close enough to surprise the zebra and she can't match his speed. The combined herd of wildebeest and zebra quickly move away to a safe distance. The lioness will have to wait until they settle and resume grazing. Then she can try again. Notice how she approaches this time. She's a steady and nonchalant, appearing to be totally disinterested in the zebra. Even so, the alert sentinels have posted themselves to keep an eye on her. The word moves into drink, but the tension among them is obvious. <laughs> Dominance battles are common among male zebra, but this display is more likely an expression of frustration in being unable to drink in peace while the lioness is present. <laughs> The fine expanse of the zebra stallions is quite impressive. Here we have an excellent opportunity to see how unique each zebra's markings are. Like human fingerprints, no two zebra are alike. This male lion approaches the female. The reproductive status of the lioness is revealed in the young, and the male has come to investigate this signal which nature has provided for him. This is not a smile. This expression is characteristic among cats during the act of testing the female's urine, a behavior called fuming. who have moved farther downstream now begin to approach the water again, but they're still apprehensive. <laughs> the zebra wisely decide to play it safe despite their thirst. resume their weekly displays of strength and aggression. <laughs> A young colt that's become separated from its mother searches through the herd for her.
background takes another look at the position of the pride before leaving his post. Although the lion has a reputation for being a deadly hunter, when we return, we'll see that he can be a scavenger as well. Attracted by a large pack of jackal feeding on the remains of a wildebeest, this lion sees an opportunity for an effortless meal. This new jackal might drive a cheetah away, but they avoid combat with a lion. The lion offers no protest when the jackal cautiously begins to return to the carcass, so he apparently wasn't very hungry. Even so, they'll wait to be certain before they resume feeding. Jackal frequently travel along or in pairs and occupy a well-defined territory. But when there's carrying to be had, they gather from all quarters to compete for a share of the meal. They have an extremely keen sense of smell, and their own record is having to track down the location of a dead springbok from a distance of nearly a mile away.